This is a talk that I'm giving since two years, every time at every conference, always the same boring talk, and I'm giving it again, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 po the point is that, well, I'm here describing a technique called software transactional memory that I will not describe, actually, because it's, well, what, what, what I want to describe is what is the benefit, what, what people like you can, can use it for. I will not go into the details of how it actually works in detail. Well, this, is, this has been a lot of work to do, etc. I think by now we are, we are well, like last month we threw everything away and started again, but this time <laughs> it will be the right one, etc. But the, the general idea of the talk still applies. So the, the problem, problem is kind of, I mean, it's uh, the global interpreter lock in Python. The problem is most computers nowadays have, CP have multiple CPUs. Well, how do you use multiple CPUs in a program? We don't know. Well, we do actually. You, you, you use other languages like C, C++, Java.net. Actually, the list is long. Uh, the list, I should also mention, the list includes Jython that runs on Java and Iron Python that runs on .NET. These are two, la two languages, I mean, they are Python languages, <coughs> but they don't have a global interpreter lock, so it's, it's v the two versions of Python that actually let you run a multi-threaded program using multiple cores. But then, well, why? So the, pi the standard Python, which is C Python, and PyPy as well, actually, don't have any story for this. Well, which by which I mean, y you, you, y yes, you can write a program that uses threads, a threading module, and, and well, it, it will feel as if you have multiple threads, but that's not actually, well, you, you can't actually use multiple threads, I mean, to do any CPU intensive computation. You, you can use threads in other ways, like you, you actually have a thread that is most of the time blocked on a system call to, to wait for a socket or do things, that's fine, that's fine. But for, for well, if you have a problem that actually has a, well, where you actually need to r to use all cycles of multiple cores, then you are uh, in trouble. I mean, there are there are actually alternatives. So I don't know the multiprocessing module, for example, is in the standard library. It's well, you have some fine alternatives. Like if you want a, a simple web server, well, you just run it four times in four different processes and works fine. If the if the, if the logic behind the web server is simple enough, you have alternatives that are that I would rather classify as completely horrible, like the form the mentioned multiprocessing module. <laughs> That's a personal opinion. Mm -hmm. So let's look uh, let's look a bit more at the global <laughs> interpreter log. It's well. It basically, basically ensures that every single bytecode of your Python program is executed atomically. So, well, this is, this is something that has, well, I mean, it, it looks like a complete internal detail, and to some extent it is, as in, this is, this is so because in C Python, well, it, it allows us, it allows people writing C Python to not have to care about correct locking everywhere. Instead, they have just this single lock and simplifies the C Python implementation a lot. Okay, now I want to contrast this with transactional memory. What is transactional memory? Well, first it's recent research as in, as in only the past, roughly the past 10 years, it was brought forward and 
is actively researched. And well, the idea is, to, is that if you have two threads that run in, in parallel and they want to access some, some data that may be the same data, what you usually do is acquire a lock in each thread. And then only one of the two threads can actually be in the critical section. Now, the transactional memory idea is the same, except that well, when the two threads are about to enter the critical section, well, you don't pause the, them. You just run them both. You run them both, but carefully. <laughs> So the, the idea basically is to, to run them both and to record, oh, this thread is reading and writing here and there in memory. That thread is reading and writing there. And then when the two critical sections are done, you, you consider, consider again what they have done. And for example, well, you hope that usually you will figure out that they did not conflict, as in, as in one thread has read this, and the other thread has uh, read that, and that's different parts of memory anyway, so, so, so everything is fine. But th then, of course, uh, of course uh, in some cases, you actually get conflicts. And in this case, you must, you must, you must for, for example, uh, roll back, which means cancel the work done by one of the thread and restart it from the beginning. So the, the, the idea is nice. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a nice idea at, as long as the threads will, in practice, often be running independent code. But well, the, 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 the current drawback of all this is, is that it actually has a high overhead. Like all the code in each transaction needs to actually be changed to do more things, like checking, checking and storing the reads and writes that it's doing. So yes, why why am I mentioning this in relationship with the Jill? Is that you can actually apply it with the Jill in mind. What you get is that. In the normal, in the standard model of two threads, you get one thread that runs one bytecode, the other thread that runs one bytecode, etc. And they have to wait for, well, only one can run at a time. But, but then, of, of course, a bytecode runs from one thread and another bytecode runs from an independent thread. Well, most of the time, they will actually, in practice, run independent things. So. So if you just apply transactional memory to this situation, then you get that they actually can run in parallel. And only from time to time, you have conflicts that are detected. And then we restart the bytecode. So that should be cheap, well, except that it isn't. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there are, two, there are two different variants of transactional memory. You have software transactional memory, which is, which is called software because it's, well, how can you do it purely in software by, 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 by doing the extra work manually? Or you have hardware transactional memory. The so basic idea is that you write the same, you produce the same assembler. I mean, you, you look at your program already compiled and you run it, and then it's the, it's the problem of the CPU to do the detection. And, um, and then you have hybrid systems that use a bit both, like use, use HTM as long as the transaction is not too large, but when the transaction becomes too large, then the, the, the CPU is no longer able to, to do the tracking. So it will abort and restart in, in a different mode in which we can use STM and so on. And uh, yes, the, the current status is that um, for the case of HTM, it is, uh, well, the Intel Haswell CPU that was released uh, in 2013 is actually 
supporting HTM. So there was already some kind of some kind of papers published about trying in with Ruby, the Ruby interpreter, which has well, which for the purpose of this talk is exactly like C Python. So it was tested with Ruby. The results are not bad, but still a bit disappointing. In the following sense, for example, they measure they measure that running running an, a program on eight different threads runs run yes it runs faster than on one thread but it runs about 4.4 times faster which means there is still an almost two times slowdown over the theoretical maximum okay hmm. and then well so htm has still almost two times slowdown stm has well at least two times slowdown so well we are we are in the w what I like to say that we are in the same situation as we are now in the same situation as we were like like 30, 30 years ago about garbage collection I mean automatic garbage collection sounded very strange and the thing that that has a huge overhead on your program well it actually took a while but nowadays we have garbage collectors that are relatively simple and that use clever techniques. <coughs> but it, it actually took a while to develop these techniques. And I think we are in the same situation with STM. I mean, the number times two will go down a lot still in the following years. Well, th th that's what I'm doing. I mean, uh, what I'm doing with another person in Switzerland. We are, we are searching a, a, v a variant of STM that is called C7, just because it's a seventh version. <laughs> uh, yes, we, we hope to get down at much less than two times now. <laughs> Insert description here, yes, well, I don't know, I mean. <laughs> Um, uh, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, I mean, um, talk to me or or read read what we publish or or well, it, it's far too big for this talk. Sorry. <laughs> yes. What I wa what I would like to to talk about instead is. Yes, so far I'm presenting a way that I think should give us us all the ability to run a multi-thread program really using multiple cores. Okay, cool. But well. <coughs> what, what I'm now presenting is uh, a way that builds on top of this feature. What? What if, I mean, the basic idea of the global interpreter lock is every byte code is atomic. Okay, what, what is a byte code? I mean, I, I, a byte code is not very, a very useful measure for normal Python programmers. How, how about, well, what if we had the, the ability to say, um, I don't want just one byte code to be atomic. I want this section of code, like these two lines, for example, the line that is going to read the global variable, add one and write it back into the same global variable. I want to increment this variable atomically, please, because, because I don't want to care about, about, uh, about another thread that would also do the incrementing in parallel. And I don't want to, to, to worry about locks around my variable. So I just want it to be done atomically. So what, I, what I'm suggesting is that it's, possi it's actually very easy to extend Python, the language, C Python, for example, with, a, with an atomic object that you use like this. You say with atomic, and then you write, well, you write two lines of code or, or, or 10,000 lines of code. But the point is that every 
instructions that are run in the with atomic are executed atomically, we, we, which, which means basically just we, well, we are not going to release the global interpreter lock as long as we are in the atomic section. That's what it means. I mean, it, so then it's just simpler to use just with atomic instead of manually acquiring and releasing locks. And it does not change anything. It has the same performance on top of C person. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the idea now you can see you can see why I'm pushing this idea is is that well with with STM or HTM you had one bytecode run after another because of the global interpreter lock and then they would actually run in parallel optimistically so here. The idea is just the same, except that the atomic section is longer than just one bytecode. It is as long as defined by the user. So in the end, in the end, we run larger atomic section. Well, in theory, one after the other, but in practice, in parallel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well. So far, so good. But what I want to point is that this approach is actually, y you, you can use this with Atomic in a way that completely hides the threads. Which means, what, what I'm saying is not only, like if you have this program that happens to be written with multiple threads, then you can use it, use it with a Piper, with the STM enabled. Yes, cool, but you don't have a program that that is written using multiple threads because, because, because normal Python programmers don't do it because it does not work on C Python. However, if you have a program that is not using threads, but I it's using some event-based system like Twisted. I mean, Twisted here is an example. You, you, take, the, you take your favorite one, basically. It can be Tornado, Eventlet, Stackless, whatever. What if, if we were, if we went inside Twisted, and we so in the Twisted reactor, so really the core, and here, what if we created four threads? Let's say we create four threads, and I mean always four, and every time we need to run a, an event, so every time we need to call back to the user of the library twisted, every time we, we put it in a with atomic block. If we do this, then the, then the end result is exactly the same. We, we have no, we did not change anything because, because the, the normal twisted program will run on one thread one event, one event, one event, one event. A twisted program modified like this will run on four threads, but still one event, one event, one event, one event. So, well, y you can see where I want to go, basically. Then if you use this multi-threaded program on a version of, on a Python interpreter with STM or HTM, then it, it will actually run the events in parallel optimistically. And this has a chance to work because precisely because because if you have if you have a complicated twisted program that ha that is CPU bound, then then well then it's a program that is handling tons of different users, for example, and then well, how do you answer? How do you compute the answer for one user that's a bit independent for? an answer for, uh, for another user. So it means each event has chances to be independent, which is, which is the key point here. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's uh, the line I want to push, basically. Mm -hmm. Yes, so this is a summary, the optimistic summary. 
Uh, now, yes, everything I described so far is, is very much optimistic. What will, what will certainly occur in practice will, will be that there will be conflicts between the threads, but there will be even conflict. I mean, there will be unexpected conflicts. Like, 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 I don't know, I don't know. For example, if Twisted has maintained the global counter of how many events it handled so far, just, just, well, then every event is going to write to that global counter, so every event is going to conflict with every, every other event, and, and, well, and you lose everything. Mm -hmm. So, yes. So, so, there are, there are there are two. Well, when when you start when you start with this in mind, at first it looks great, like at first everything will be parallel. However, in practice it will not, and and well, and you will see some conflicts, some some conflicts that are that can be resolved, like the. the, the for example, the, the maintaining a global counter would create such a conflict. So, so you you need tools. For example, debug-like tools that would point to you to you. Oh, here, this is this line here is causing most of the bots in, in your program. So then, then you need to think a bit and I don't know make make the counter thread local or, or have a fix basically, and and so on and so forth. So so. There, is, there are fixes for you to do. There are fixes for us to do. In the sense, in the sense, we need to, to, well, we need to fix twisted, for example, internally, for, for again, for these issues of conflict. Uh, we need to, we need to think probably a bit more deep, even if the dictionary standard type of Python. I mean, it's possible to improve it. Like if you have one thread that writes uh, in a dictionary but writes one key, and another thread that writes in the same dictionary but writes another key, then that's not really a conflict, etc. So it's, it's all work <laughs> pending basically. The point the point is that well, the point the point of this approach is that well, first you don't have to worry about threads and locks and everything, but the, the real point is that your program is always correct. I mean, as far uh, as correct as it was when, <laughs> when running one thread, obviously. The program is always correct, and then you need to work a bit to fix the, the conflicts, which means if you don't, it's not going to be faster. But if you work a bit, then it's going to be faster. And, and yes, well, what you get with multi-threading is that your program is always fast with multi-threading, but if you forget just one lock in one corner, then well, then you get dead locks, then you get live locks, races, all these kind of interesting names. So the the the, the, ma the main difference is that with the STM approach, you need well, you need to fix some issues until your program is fast enough, as opposed to the threading approach where you need to fix all issues of why your program is buggy. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So this is just to give a bit the, the scope. I mean, here I've talked, uh, talked about Twisted. OK, Twisted is just one example you, you can replace with any event-based system or, or even not. You can have a CPU bound program that would have a big loop for x in some dictionary, then do something with every single key. This is a typical example where where it can be also parallelized. I mean, every single every single computation on one particular key. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so, so the real point is here, basically, as long as it has a good chance to be parallelized, then, then it will be. Mm -hmm. So yes, <laughs> this, this is just a, here I'm repeating what I said at the start is that, well, it's like two years that I've been presenting this talk. Well, 
there is a risk it will not work in the end, but I bet it will. <laughs> yes, and uh, the, the, cur the current status is that the C7 approach, STM C7, is really looking good, but then it's, well, it's looking very good, but it's only going to work on 64-bit Linux systems because it's using a special system call that exists only on Linux. <laughs> yeah, remap file pages. <laughs> who who knows the system call remap file pages? <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Impressive. <laughs> Yes. Uh, uh, questions? Uh, yes. Questions. I mean, may maybe. <laughs> maybe it will end up working also on on Windows or Mac with additional with a small additional driver that you need to install. I mean, yes. Mm -hmm. How would you handle um, error unwind in case of a ah. conflict protection? Because if you say it's a server which has sent a response, then... Y yes, well, uh, I mean, with, with Atomic is really Atomic. Um, it means I if you get a conflict, then you restart the, the execution, and it should be completely transparent to the user. Now, if inside the with Atomic you actually do some input output like send something so you cannot cancel the sending so what occurs is that this is a this is a bad transaction basically it becomes inevitable which means unavoidable which means which means that well there is at least well it, it means it guarantees the success of this transaction Which, which is a state that only one in p on your parallel num on your n transaction running now can be in. So if you started both blocks, if you, if you started both blocks, you've got two threads, mm -hmm. both of them at the same with a ton exception, mm -hmm. okay, and then they're both underway, mm -hmm. and one of them does this unavoidable IO. Mm -hmm. No, you you run it still in the hope that it's not going to do input output. <laughs> then you can <laughs> well, if it, if it's really doing also input output, th then you have a problem. Then you need to to suspend the, the thread. Oh, I see. So you're capable you of trapping the I/O on the second one. Yes. Ah, mm -hmm. right, yes. Sorry. Exactly. Yes. 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 Uh, sorry. Can you give an idea about the previous six versions and what we're <laughs> <talking> about? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, 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 the current most developed version is, well, is just too complex, basically. It's a version in which every single object manipulated by the interpreter, every single object can be, can be in a number of states that I don't know, there are 14 different flags on each object, just to give you an idea. <laughs> they can be private, protected, public, depending on how much published there are. Uh, and then you get several copies of the objects, and then you must carefully, oh, but here I'm finding a pointer, but it's not a pointer to the latest version I need to follow. Mm. Yes, it, wa it, was a, it was an idea basically optimized for the common case of you have you the objects that the thread modify are have been created just now, or the thread is accessing global objects but only for reading. But as soon as you have one object that is not fitting into this model, then <coughs> performance is terribly terrible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think are some results with the C seven? When? When? Yeah, when? When? In the next few months. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. so I'm curious, how do you test that it works? I mean, <laughs> uh, how, I suppose you have to, I don't know, intercept all the six calls or to... Uh, yes, for, from that, no, fr from that point of view, we are, uh, we are using the infrastructure in PyPy because PyPy Pi is written in R Python. 
So it means doing a syscall from the interpreter means really uh, doing, well, going one special <coughs> way. I mean, we need to write special R Python code to mean now please call this external C function. So, so this is a, uh, the place where we just say, oh, and by the way, uh, turn the transaction inevitable. I mean, yeah, it's no, kind of easy. Yeah, it is equivalent. You can find out there if the behavior is equivalent to the one without the uh, Yes, yes, yes. I mean, yes. It's, a, it's another test of, another test that it works is just that, well, you, 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 you write a small C library that does carefully the, the checking and everything, and then you just run some random demo on top of PyPy. This is going to test all possible levels. Mm -hmm. it, it's, yes, kind of, kind of the bad approach for unit testing, yes, I know, <laughs> but <laughs> we, we, we also have some unit tests. Yes, well, what happens to nat native code? The general, the general answer is that around a call to a nat native code, there is now there is already code. There is release the gil and reacquire the gil. So, you assume that so the native code is not the yes, mm -hmm. it is it basically it's a very easy change in the interpreter, where the interpreter would release the gil, you end the transaction. And when it reacquires the gil, you start the next transaction. Okay, thank you. Thank you.